actually, uh, my talk is kind of on how to not be a judgmental asshole on the internet, which a lot of us need help with, including myself some days. Uh, and I just kind of came up with the title with, because um, I was thinking about mashed potatoes at the time, really. You just never know what I'm going to come up with some days. So um, for any of you who don't know me, my name is Sasha Bates. I was an independent consultant for several years, and then I started working for Chef last August. I've been using Chef since 2010, and I love it. Love it a lot. Uh, I have a blog. I run the Twin Cities Infracoder meetups. That um, there are some people here who never come, even though they live there. And also, you might have heard me on the Ship Show podcast because it's awesome. Hi, I didn't know you were here. I'm so glad. <laughs> Sorry. Friends, hugs. We got a hug. All right. So. Um, this could be boring, and I, yesterday somebody goes, um, so what track are you on? And I was like, we have tracks? <laughs> That's cool. Uh, they put me in the testing track. Uh, if you expect this talk to be about testing, you should probably go to Fletcher's talk, which is up in the ballroom. That's all about catching, and it's going to be awesome. So otherwise, um, the stuff that I want to talk to you about, empathy, compassion, it's going to be awesome. Oh, crap. I can't see my notes. There we go. That was almost a disaster of epic proportions. So yeah, if you don't want to talk about that stuff, you should probably go to Fletcher's talk, because he has 186 slides. <laughs> it's going to be really awesome. So the things that I want to talk about today, basically, are um, why are people making choices that you hate? Right? I mean, this is really why you get upset on the internet. Because people make choices and you're like, that's so stupid. Well, the real question I want to ask you is, why do you care? Why do you care half the time? It's not going to affect your life at all. Um, you're never going to be affected by it. It's never going to have anything to do with you. Um, and it's probably working for them. So why do you want to argue about that? So a little bit about me and why I can talk to you about this stuff. Um, Everybody knows that I have some opinions. I'm really opinionated. And I have a lot of opinions on Chef and how you should implement things. And ever since I became a consultant, I have been learning to cope with the fact that I also am sometimes judgmental and uh, don't always want to listen to why people do things the way they do. But really, um, we really need to learn to get past like that emotional attachment to solutions, especially uh, if you're consulting or if you're trying to challenge or champion other things in your company. Um, it's important to not get bogged down by things that don't matter. Sometimes things that might matter in other situations, too, don't matter. How many of you have been this person? This is like my favorite ever, right? You just can't let something go, right? Even though it has nothing to do with anything ever. and it's somebody else's company, right? So I want to talk a little bit about being judgmental. And the definition I found was a tendency to make moral judgments. So being judgmental gets in the way of judgment, I find, because it also tends to be an emotional component, right? So moral is, can you raise, read this? It's probably a little dark. I didn't think it would be quite so light in here. Um, I'm going to read it to you. Concerned with the principles of right and wrong behavior and the goodness or badness of human character. So when you're being judgmental, you're being emotional, and you're making judgments about people and how good or bad they are. And again, this comes out in your discussions on the internet and how you sound and how you make people feel and how you feel yourself when you go, well, I'm trying to do this thing, and I know it's not great, but..." I'm kind of stuck having to do it anyway. Can you give me a hand with like figuring it out? And somebody's like, well, why would you do that? That's so stupid, right? You should never do that. You should do this instead. And you're like, well, I can't for whatever reason, right? So people are being, making moral judgments about you when, you're, when they're being judgmental. And it produces a lot of emotion in, in yourself and the person that is um, being judged. And what we're lacking, really, is context. Right? You don't know. 
you don't know the circumstances or the limitations that people are operating under when they need to do something. When they ask you, how can I do this thing with, say, I don't even know, setting up uh, static routes or setting up an OS level component that um, you're like, why would you ever do that? That is a horrible idea and you should burn in hell, right? But you shouldn't because a lot of times it's because there's something limiting them from actually doing what they would rather do, right? Why are you using CentOS 5? Because why? Why are you using Red Hat 5? Why are you using, um, why did you deploy your entire internet app on Windows? I mean, who does that, right? People talk about this stuff and people judge it. And then it becomes really hard for people who are in these situations to insert themselves into the community, to feel like they're part of the crowd. When we make jokes about Windows, I mean, I make jokes about Windows all the time, but I try to really be careful where I'm making them these days because I know a lot of people who work with Windows machines and they're not happy about it. I mean, but some of them are. Like, I dated a guy who was a PowerShell automation specialist and he loved it. And I gave him so much shit. <laughs> but, um, you know, you have to be really careful with the, the limitations that people are operating under and stuff because you just don't know. You really don't know where a lot of people are coming from. And so I've been that person, like I said, I've been doing a lot of this stuff. And one day I realized um, I needed to stop giving shits about other people and what they were doing with their lives when it didn't matter to me. Because if you're constantly upset about what other people are doing, it really kind of creates a cramp in your own life. Like, it, it makes you anxious a lot and unhappy. Oops, unhappy. And you constantly find yourself posting shit on the internet that nobody needs to see. So like how many people here, and I have trouble with this too, is, are doing the thing where somebody posts a question to the mailing list. Does anybody know how to do blah? And then all of a sudden you get five answers with people going, no, I have no idea. Well, did we all really need to post that? Because guess what, nobody knows. But I mean, finding yourself feeling compelled to answer things that you really aren't contributing to um, is a really great thing to get rid of in your life. I found that it really helped me a lot to go, do I really have to engage with that? Nope, sure don't. So, I mean, part of this is that because um, we want to encourage people to find the right way to do stuff instead of telling them to do things, right, too. We don't want to dictate to people in the community, especially that's one of the hallmarks of the chef community specifically is that we want you to find the right way to do stuff that works for you. So, but when something is accepted as the right way, it becomes really difficult to have those discussions without people feeling religious about them. And so then things get, then things can get tense, right? So um, the things that I want to talk about today, um, I'm not your mom. I'm not going to tell you what's right or wrong here. Um, and I'm not going to tell you to stop being a jerk on, well, yeah, actually I am. I'm going to tell you to stop being a jerk on the internet, if you possibly can. Right? I try every day. Sometimes I'm better at it than others. Um, but before you respond to something, think about why you want to respond to it and really whether it's going to help them or whether it matters, right? So, yeah. I'm also not going to do the hand raising thing in here today. I'm not going to ask you if you're uh, using my use cases on one side or the other because that's not important and I'm not interested in setting up any kind of conflict in here for that kind of stuff. So. I mean, we're going to talk about some stuff, and I'm going to tell you about both sides of it, I hope, in ways that makes you think about things a little differently. And uh, hopefully it will be interesting, but again, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand and tell me how you feel about stuff, because um, that's not the point today at all. So a couple of different scenarios that I've encountered several times um, are things that I kind of want to talk about, which hopefully will be interesting to you guys too, and maybe we can talk about it more after as far as like other things that you've seen or perceived. So server labels, naming your servers, right? This is a discussion that comes up a lot, and it, it borders on religion for some people. Containers. Everybody loves a container today, right? But people argue on both sides of whether or not they're at all useful. And people get really emotional about it, right? And my favorite, and the one that I find to be the most interesting, Berkshelf. And um, the stuff around Berkshelf, not just Berkshelf the tool, but like the workflows that have grown up around Berkshelf. So here we go. Naming servers. In 2012, there was a thread 
on the chef mailing list where some guy just asked a question. He was like, dude, it would be really cool to have this thing in Knife EC2 where we could, something to do with making it easier to get to servers, with giving them a label of some kind so that I can actually get to a server when I need to. And um, yeah, I read that. First responders to this, the, two fir the first two emails responses to this. Like I've been angry about this now for like two years. Because it's 2014 and I'm so upset about this whole email thread, which made me really angry. That was the first one. Uh, labels are for jam jars, not machinery. And plus one. And I was like, dude, why do you even type? How is this helping, right? I mean, why do you have to be a jerk to some guy who just wants to know why? You know, some people are still naming servers. It's a thing. I'm glad that you know you are not doing that anymore and you live in this perfect world where you don't have to, but like 90% of the world is not there. People are labeling servers in some ways or others at this point. So this made me really sad. I mean, I get that not everybody thinks that naming servers is a good idea. I don't give a shit, right? I have so many things that I actually care about. Whether or not you put labels on your servers and need to SSH to them doesn't even make my list of like backup things to get upset about right now. Right? But some people feel really strongly about this because it's indicative of um, the way you manage a lot of your infrastructure culture, right? whether your servers have names, whether they have labels, whether you SSH to them, whether you maintain them, whether you can dispose of them quickly and easily, or if it's important to know what's going on. But in general, there are not that many people who live in this world where you can just get rid of servers whenever you want and you don't have to care about them at all. We all want to get there but not many of us are there. So responses like that don't help. And it made that guy probably feel really like shit to um, have that on the chef mailing list where we're nice and we want to help people. So, you know, he probably felt defensive and um, I don't really know what happened to him after. I think he defended himself for a little while and then the, the conversation just kind of went on from there. I even got into it for a little while because I was pretty upset. So I kind of want to talk about my potato parable for a second. Um, bear with me. I'm hungry. I'm really hungry. I'm hungry right now. All I've got is a fork and a bowl of potatoes. And all I'm allowed to make is mashed potatoes. Now, I might have some half-cooked potatoes. I might have some specific ingredients that they gave me to make mashed potatoes, and I still only have a fucking fork. I don't think I'm supposed to say that anymore. Right? So, like, telling me that I should have started a year ago growing my own organic potatoes in my garden or getting them from a really reputable CSA doesn't do me any good. I'm not going to not starve today because, uh, because of the potatoes, right? It's great advice, and maybe for next year, I can start growing some potatoes, but actually I'm not sure that I can because I've got 10 million other things that I'm trying to do, and keeping a vegetable patch um, isn't going to make the list. So I don't know. Is it actually good advice to give me that? Um, I'm still hungry, and I'm still not eating because nobody's helping me mash my potatoes with a fork. Right? Especially with chef. We want hugs. Because that's what we promise people. We promise people that we want them to be able to uh, to do what works for them and to help them figure out what they need to do with the resources they have. Um, we don't want to dictate. We want to help people figure out best practices, but we don't want to dictate necessarily. And we don't want to be mean about it either, right? And so it makes me sad to see non-productive comments show up like that. Um, one, of the, one of my favorite things that I actually said in there, because a lot of people live in a world where everything is legacy. Like, you don't get to build stuff from scratch. Almost nobody does. But um, Sometimes people act like that's all that you do. And I'm like, dude, sometimes when you're building a house where the barn was, you have to shovel a lot of shit before you get to install the Viking appliances and lay down the hardwood, right? So in a perfect world, yeah, we all want disposable servers that we terminate whenever they give us a problem, right? We don't even care what the problem is. We just want to get rid of it. <laughs> because the next one will be perfect, I'm sure. In a perfect world, we give no shits. They're disposable. They're terminated when they misbehave. We never SSH into them. How many? No, I'm not going to ask. <laughs> not going to ask. Doesn't matter. I still SSH into servers that uh, are hassling me sometimes. Um, there's almost nobody that I know live in this dream, 100%. 
um, they're probably all five-man startups in San Francisco. So in an even more perfect world, we have context. So we, we understand that people actually have things that are going on that maybe they don't have any control over. Maybe, you know, maybe they're limited by constraints that we don't know. Maybe they have apps that actually depend on those special server names to know what they're doing. Well, that's unfortunate, but it's a fact of life. Maybe they are trying to champion something like Chef, and they don't want to get distracted by, um, by other discussions that are just going to derail conversations about bringing in the config management tool or the, or the, the, the amazing monitoring tool that they want to bring in. You know, I mean, if you've managed to hit that nirvana state with your own servers, that is so cool. But a lot of people are not there yet. So, like, they could have had a long history of labeling servers too. Like, they just have a bunch there. You can't just like turn that off overnight. I used to work for a consulting company. Well, actually, it was management and monitoring, and all of the client's servers came through the same monitoring system, right? So everybody came through the HPOV console, and we had a prescribed labeling system for all of the servers that told what client they were at, what airport they were nearest, what kind of server they were. So as soon as the alert came up, the guy in India or the guy in San Francisco knew exactly what client it belonged to and what kind of problem it was. So maybe today there's a better solution for that, but it was a big deal at the time. You know, so I guess what I try to remember is that, like, we just want to remember that not everybody is where we think they should be sometimes. And it's important to, like, if you want to bring them there with you, then we can't be mean about it, I guess. The next thing I want to talk about is containers. This is a pretty short section. Because um, I haven't actually seen anybody be mean about containers, just heated on the internet. Um, you guys can read about LXCs and Docker containers and all of that stuff all over the internet. And people who have opinions on whether or not they replace configuration management or whether they enhance it or whatever. I mean, it really depends on what you think. I know that we've been doing some internal work on it, and like a lot of people here have been doing work on them. And they bring a lot of really great stuff to the community. People are really serious about the container stuff, though. They're really into it. And some people really do think that you can replace everything else with containers. But they're not instant salvation, and they're a lot like that magic sparkly DevOps thing, where if you think that you can just start building containers and getting rid of everything else, um, you're probably going to be in for a surprise because those containers still have to live somewhere. And there's still going to be some, it's kind of like no apps, right? I mean, most people aren't really dealing with the operations, or Heroku. Most people aren't really dealing with that stuff. But somebody in the basement is still making sure the servers are on so that containers can live on top of them. So somebody is there and has to cope with that. So like. <laughs> the Docker box doesn't come with a magic DevOps Sparkle Pony, right? You still, people are hard, and containers uh, are not going to fix people. And that's really where uh, I think people start falling off with what's going on. Um, template VMs, does anybody remember template VMs? We had those. Nobody ever updated the template VM, right? You'd be like, I need to build some servers, and they'd be like, oh, you should patch the template VM. Nobody did, and then you have to update and patch all of the little VMs that you build from it. Or it's still running like, you know, three versions of the OS ago or whatever, right? Nobody ever maintained the template VM. So, I mean, it just became a huge pain. It became kind of like a time suck. Or kickstarts, right? Nobody updated the kickstart. So we, did, we built a whole bunch of servers, and we knew that the kickstart needed some work, but we were too busy. So then uh, six months later, you have to add in a whole bunch more servers for whatever peak season planning that you're doing. And nobody's updated the kickstart yet again. And somebody else ends up going in with their SSH loops, fixing all the things that were wrong with the kickstart. Or these days, we actually have config management that will help with that, which is really cool. Because now we no longer have to run SSH loops, which makes me really happy. So yeah, and that's, that's the big deal for me, is that if you treat containers like all of the other stuff that we keep treating things like over the years, they're just going to end up the same way, a stale piece of information that still needs maintenance that isn't getting it. Right? It has some really great stuff, though. So same thing. Right? Um, I was on a project where we knew that there were problems with the kickstarts. I went on vacation for two weeks, because he was like, no, we need, to, we need to start building stuff right away. And I was like, no, we need to fix the kickstarts first before we do this, because um, the posts were enormous. They were like 
weeks of post for every server. And they were all wrong. I went on vacation for two weeks, and I came back, and they built everything. And we spent the next six months running SSH loops. So containers, this is the real problem, right? Who here loves working with the OS? That's a, that's a safe question. It's, it's a safe question, because I mean, a lot of people do like it. Like, um, I know, right? Like, I've been to lunch with you guys, and you scare me <laughs> with the stuff that you talk about. But people love it. I hate it. I mean, I want the OS to go away so that I can do interesting work. Um, I just want it to work. A lot of people are like that. Containers give us that, right? They solve real problems for real people, but someone still has real hardware somewhere. There's a data center with a bunch of servers somewhere with changeable components. I mean, that's the other thing with Docker, right? Because it has reusable components that you can use. But if you're still reusing the same Apache component that you made months ago without any updates to it, that you have then been like updating by hand someplace else, then you're still making the same mistake that we made with VM templates and kickstarts and everything else. So again, the thing that you have to think about is where are, you know, where is reality coming from? And how are we going to cope with the fact that we still need to maintain something? And so when we get excited about whether or not um, containers solve all our problems or don't solve all our problems, we have to remember context. What problems are we trying to solve? And whose problems are we trying to solve? Right? And are we going to be able to use this everywhere? How's my time? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. All right, Bergshelf. This is my other favorite thing to talk about because I love Bergshelf. I've loved Bergshelf since the moment I met it. I'm completely biased when it comes to Bergshelf. Completely. I think it's awesome and amazing. And for a while, I didn't understand why everybody didn't like it. The moment I saw it, I could see a bunch of problems that it solved for me. So when I talk about Bergshelf, I'm not just talking about the tool, which is cool. Um, I'm talking about dependency resolution. I'm talking about application cookbooks. I'm talking about roles and role cookbooks. And all of the other problems that it was made to solve. It was written at Riot Games. Everybody knows this, right? Riot Games is big. Um, they were born in 2006. They released their first game in 2009. Um, they are at 1,500 and growing, according to Jeff Hackert, who I just talked to 10 minutes ago. I actually updated a number from earlier. Um, they're really big, considering that they just, they just started up. Really born in 2006, released in 2009. And they're enormous. Lots of growth, very diverse code base. They run on both Windows and Linux and that uh, they run all over the world. Many, many dev teams. Giant data center infrastructures everywhere, including China. And they have a really critical user base. Not critical like important, but critical like 12-year-old boys who are angry all the time on Reddit, important. <laughs> really critical, really angry, really vocal. Um, so I mean, Bergshelf was made to cope with that, right? Like with large organizations where you need to get a lot, of, um, a lot of reusable components out fast to people who don't necessarily have the time to understand what's going on with them, right? Chef is great. They've been using Chef since like nine. And, but they didn't always have the time to, you know, developers, they just want to write their Java, man, right? So when it appeared, I was actually over at a really big company suffering from a lot of problems, right? I was suffering from we were in a large organization. We had poor communication. We struggled with trust um, and ownership issues where people didn't want to own cookbooks, but other people did, or people wanted to dictate how cookbooks would be written, but didn't want to own them. And what you really found is that uh, the same really crappy early adopter code was being copied and pasted all over the organization. And everybody was using it, and it was really hard to care for. So once things actually got to the point where they went to production, where we had an ops team, they were like, what is this bullshit that you're handing us to use? Because it's terrible, and it doesn't work very well. Um, and so I could see all of a sudden with Bergshelf, a lot of the stuff that we needed could be solved. right? So we could actually give somebody something that described 
uh, an application in a cookbook. It was versionable. One of the things that we had there that just made me cringe every time I saw it were timestamped roles. Every time they updated a role, they timestamped it. And they were all checked in. Which, you know, that's cool. But um, have you ever seen a timestamped role? And um, yeah, I'm just going to stop there with that. Uh, and so you could really see a lot of the advantages that would come from that. And I was like, this is amazing. Why would nobody, why, wouldn't, why is there anybody ever who wouldn't want to use this? Um, and I thought it was awesome. And I heard people arguing about it and stuff. But I was like, I just didn't get it. Like, because it was obvious to me why it was awesome. Because Java developers just want to write Java. Most developers really do. They've already got a full-time job writing the code every day, and they're already sick of messing around when their app doesn't work. Right? I mean, how many times have they wasted two or three days because they have server issues uh, in dev? Right? The last thing they want is another tool to use that they don't know anything about written in another language that they have to learn before they can be successful. <coughs> so like, what you really get here is the ability to distribute uh, components of information to people who don't have time to understand it, but they can still use it and be successful quickly. And Bergshelf gives you a lot of that, right? So um, I'm going to stop evangelizing here because I want to get to the other side of that discussion, right? Um, it wasn't until there was a food fight show in, again, 2012, where we were actually talking about cookbook versioning that um, really started to coalesce a lot of my thoughts for me. Uh, and so John Cowie and Jamie Windsor were on there, and we talked about a lot of the different ways that you can version cookbooks which has nothing to do with Bookshelf specifically, but we talked about a lot of the tools that they used on both sides, like Knife Spork, like Etsy uses rolls. You know, they're cool with it. Um, and I really started to see some of the differences um, between the two companies and between the two, you know, between the use cases. And the big thing here is that, like, size matters, right? Um, when you have intimacy on your teams, when you have trust, when you have uh, really good cross-team collaboration, you don't need an elaborate framework to save you from a lot of the stuff that Bookshelf saves us from. You need small tools that help you not stomp on each other's toes once in a while, right? So Knife Spork was a big discussion in that. That's still a really great podcast. I think it's still completely relevant, despite the fact that it's two years old. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we talked about are still workflow problems that people deal with today and really struggle with. So that's what really started making me think about that a lot, is that, look, Etsy and Riot founded it at almost the same time, 2005, 2006. Etsy, according to their website that I read yesterday, has 450 employees, which is roughly somewhere in there. Um, I was just asking Jeff, and he says they're at 1,500 already. And they cannot staff fast enough for what they're doing. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, and that really, to me, shows me a lot of the big difference between some of the use cases and the tools and the struggles that we have in this community with Bookshelf and with the other tools that we use. Chef Librarian is another, right? It's a very specific tool that does a very specific thing. And Bookshelf has grown out to be a very large suite of tools that does, it, that does things sometimes in ways that people don't like. Even people who like Bookshelf are frustrated with it sometimes. So, and I know there's been a lot of discussion on the internet about whether or not people love this or not. I'm not going to go there too much, just because I kind of really talked about that in my first section quite a bit, I guess. Um, but this was the big takeaway for me, is that um, big teams, big companies, who need ways to um, distribute a framework to a lot of people who don't necessarily have time to understand it, but still want to use it, need things like Bergshelf, whereas smaller companies don't need them and are actually hindered by them because um, that just becomes a meaningless process for them. So, right, Etsy uses roles. They're cool. They're cool with the roles. Riot uses the application cookbooks where they actually uh, conversion everything and describe applications in greater detail and complexity that a lot of people don't necessarily need. Um, so, yeah. It really doesn't matter. I mean. A lot of these tools are real, solving for problems that people have in lots of different situations. And it kind of goes back to the empathy thing that I'm talking about. Just because it doesn't work for you doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that you don't need that tool. Or possibly it doesn't meet your needs because you have more complex needs that, uh, that you might need to solve, right? This is my Easter egg bonus slide. This wasn't in the agenda, but I thought it would be fun. Because officially, I'm supposed to say chef, right? And everybody here, of course, wants to use chef. But you know what? Um, I also bootstrapped the InfraCoders meetup 
in Minneapolis. And I am a big fan of configuration management and infrastructure as code and all of those things. And I really think that people need to get there first and uh, not worry quite so much about what tools other people are using and not get emotional about it and not have these great debates online that are emotional about whether it's Chef versus Puppet or uh, Chef versus Ansible or Puppet versus Salt. Like when I worked in Portland in December, I had beers with the Puppet Labs guys. It was super. Like the engineers, we don't care. Right? We like each other. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's really not that big of a deal to a lot of people. And I really think that people need to get to where they're using something first. So yeah, that's my thing, um, Puppet and Chef. And you know, the real takeaway here, you need to do what works for you. We want to help you do that. We want to help you on the mailing list. We want to help you on IRC. We want to help you here and any place else, really. I mean, Chef was written in response to being dictated to by other tools. And that's why it can be really hard to use. And that's why it's really complicated. And that's why we don't always do a good job telling you what you ought to do, because everybody is so individual and so different that you know, there is often just no easy one answer for things. But we want to help you do what's right for you. I got to stand. All right, that's it. Yay, and I didn't go over. Nine minutes to spare. Anybody want to have a fight? <laughs> you want to ask questions? Anybody wants to have a fight? Bring it. You know, I don't fight, but um, you talk a lot about empathy and compassion. And I'm so you, uh, hello. Oh, it is? Okay. Um, you talked a lot about empathy and compassion, and I'm curious in uh, your experiences as a consultant and where you've seen teams that have uh, failed at trying to cultivate that and teams that have succeeded at cultivating that, what do you think, you know, kind of as an outside third-party observer, like what was the difference in how they went about that that made the, the successful people successful? I mean, I don't want to be all like DevOpsy and shit, but um, and it's not really beer, but it's the talking, it's the communications. I mean, I mean, I need that slide from last November where I had the it's not DevOps, it's human interaction, right? It's not actually a higher, uh, a higher function. It's just basic human interaction. People who are actually trying to communicate and um, are not in it for themselves, like all the time, who actually want to help other teams be successful as well. Um, that's really one of the big differences. Sometimes, I mean, it's really hard to get people to like what you're doing, and there is no winning. But you know, that's really something that I have seen though, where it works better when people actually like talk. Any thoughts on? I think I'm good actually. Or not? Whatever. Any thoughts on uh, how to build that human interaction when the staff is remote and possibly in multiple locations? Or even time zones. I mean, I'm remote, uh, and we struggle with that too, because we have a lot of remote folks, and sometimes we're really bad about getting onto all of the room. We have boatloads of remote tools that we use. Um, and it's really just a matter of uh, just trying to remember to make people feel included, I guess. Um, we joked last night that we're really transparent, but then um, it's not that people don't tell us stuff, it's that they just forget to tell us stuff. It's not that they don't want to tell us things. They just forget. So I mean, that's really tough, especially when you're doing it um, in between teams, especially if you have like an adversarial relationship between two teams who are not together. Um, uh, planes. Planes and beers. I'm serious. I'm serious. Get, get people out to other cities. Uh, I had a, one of my earlier jobs. We actually bought a company um, across town. And they felt really put upon by a lot of stuff because they were in a different office and they were not welcome to be, they really felt like a third party citizen set. And I started going out there one day a week because I was working on a production support team at the time. I would go out there one day a week and work all day in a booth there and um, have a meeting with them and make sure that all of their issues were being met and cared for and that they knew that somebody gave a shit. I mean, um, giving shits is 90% of the battle. Being perceived to give those shits too, I guess.
Well, if that's it, five minutes of your own time back. Have a beer.